Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to EDF Live, an ongoing series of conversations with experts across a range of issues. I sincerely hope you're joining us safe and healthy from your homes. Today, we're going to talk about the upcoming election with Rich Tao, a frequent contributor to CNN and Sirius's XM POTUS channel uh, programs. I, for one, can't wait. That's because I love politics. And luckily, I've pieced together a nifty little career so far in and around campaigns and government. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Joe Bonfilio, and I spent about a decade in politics on Capitol Hill before joining EDF about nine years ago. I served as president of EDF Action, EDF's advocacy and political partner, uh, and have been in that role for about two years now. While EDF does not engage in electoral politics, EDF Action does and we will be very, very active this year in the race for president, all the way down the ballot to state legislative races across the country. If you wanna know more about what we do and why we're doing it, hop on over to edfaction.org slash join and drop your email in the form. If you wanna follow me on Twitter, I'm at jbonfig, J-B-O-N-F-I-G, and I posted a link to this, uh, to the website just a few minutes ago. For this conversation, we're going to dive into the mind of the swing voter, that confounding cohort of Americans that routinely decide the biggest uh, elections in this country. Maybe they're a steel worker in Michigan or a retired shopkeeper in Pennsylvania, a stay-at-home parent in Wisconsin, or a lifelong farm supply salesman in Iowa. The common thread? Each one likely voted for Barack Obama, in some cases twice, only to turn around and vote for Donald Trump in the last election. Obama-Trump voters were one of the biggest reasons Donald Trump is now president. Remember, Trump won Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and the Electoral College by less than 80,000 votes combined. And those swing voters might do it again. But this election won't be 2016. It won't be like any election we've ever seen. Our country has gone to the polls through world wars, economic upheaval, and civil unrest but we've never experienced an election with this list of ingredients. A pandemic health crisis with no, with no foreseeable end, sweeping worldwide economic collapse with crippling job losses, and deep, bitter partisanship that colors how Americans perceive nearly all information, and especially the news media. But here it is. Election day is just 158 days away. But who's counting? I certainly am not. Now, I'm going to venture to say that there are not many uh, on this, on this con in this conversation today that would consider themselves a swing voter. But if you were, Rich Tao knows what you think. We'd like this to be a conversation with you, so please join in. On the right side of the screen, you will see a button marked Q&A, and you can enter your question there. We'll get to as many questions as we can. If we don't get to yours and you have a question after we conclude, please email us at events at edf.org. And one more note, this is our most multimedia conversation we've hosted to date. We're going to push the capabilities of our video conference system, so please bear with us if technology hiccups arise. And we will, we will try to re repeat key points if the internet or something else gets in the way. Now let me, let me introduce Rich. Our guest presenter today has two titles. One is his business title, which is president of Engage Us, which his firm specializes in message testing, message refinement for major trade associations and advocacy groups. Rich's other title is moderator of the Swing Voter Project. He recently passed the two thirds mark on a 21 month odyssey where he has been focused on learning as much as he can about Obama Trump and Romney, Quint Romney Clinton swing voters in the upper Midwest. His findings are profiled each month in Axios and are shaping the coverage of the 2020 campaign. Finally, Rich serves as an advisory board member for the Clear Path Foundation and has conducted extensive message testing work on how to talk to conservatives about clean energy and climate. We are thrilled to welcome you, Rich, to EF Live. The virtual floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Joe. I can't tell you how much of an honor it is for me to be with all of you today. Thank you so much for having me. So what we're going to do is talk today about the all-important topic of which way will swing voters swing. 
And I want to talk to you a little bit about what we uncovered in the project and how it relates specifically to your suite of issues. So if we can go to the next slide, I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, as Joe mentioned, it's a 21-month project. We started in March of 2019, and it's running through this, the election. Our project partners are uh, Dialsmith, which is a division of my company uh, that is doing all the, the tech work on the project, and then Focus Point Global is a firm that's doing all the recruiting of these Obama, Trump, and Romney Clinton voters. Methodology is a blend of focus groups and dial testing. Uh, for the first 12 months, the focus groups were in person. For the last three months, they have been via Zoom. I'm going to share with you today four of the top trends from the first 15 months of the research. And as uh, Joe mentioned, uh, we have this partnership with Axios, and we get picked up all the time in other news sources. The idea is to have people understand what we're doing so uh, that it has resonance across the country. Next. So this is a list of where we've been so far. These are cities and counties that disproportionately swung from Obama to Trump between 2012 and 2016. We're concentrating on the upper Midwest and made one detour to Florida back in February. Next. So why are we undertaking this project? Why are we doing this? Like what would cause me to want to fly back and forth between the East Coast where I live and the Midwest? And there are three reasons. The first one is that in 2016, the pollsters polled, but they did not consistently listen. And to me, sitting down and talking to people face to face is the way you understand what's really happening for them. Polling has its place, it's critically important, but it's not the entire story. And in 2020, we wanted to make sure that no one would be surprised by the outcome of the election. No one should be shocked. Certainly people might not like the outcome or they might be overjoyed by it, but nobody should be shocked. And the other reason we're doing this, of course, is to promote my company's ability to uncover some key insights. Next slide. So the first thing I want you to know about these voters, and I would say by far the most important thing to know about them, is that they're low-information voters. They don't get their news the way you get your news. So if you get your news from the Wall Street Journal or Politico or Washington Post, you're not like these people. Let me tell you where they do get their news. They disproportionately, next slide, get their, view, their news from local TV news. Now, I live in suburban Philadelphia. The local news here is sports, weather, crime, and traffic. And that's it. So you get very little political news. You get very little policy news. And that explains why I didn't, did not hear a lot of things during the course of my research around the, the upper Midwest. These people also get their news from local websites, sometimes websites of those TV stations, sometimes independent websites. Some of them, about a third, get their news from cable news. A lot of them get their news from Facebook. Um, they also get their news from, uh, local, from national uh, TV morning and evening news shows, and a bunch of them get their news from news aggregators on their devices. But if you ask them, they don't know what the original source of the news is. They just know that it comes from, from Apple News or Yahoo or something like that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to show you a quick video clip of people telling me where they got their news. I just want you to hear in their own voices where they say they get their news. Please play the first clip. And where you get your, your news. I listen to Fox News. I listen to CNN. MSN and The Blade. Facebook and The Blade. Usually the debates and colleagues. The 11 News and Facebook. Detroit News, Detroit Free Press, and The Blade. Thank you. Reading The Washington Post. Go on Twitter, hear a couple of speeches. Facebook. Yahoo News. Local News. Podcast. CNN and Read The Blade and Facebook. Um, Channel 2, which is... W-B-A-Y. It's all local news. I would say most of it's true. Fox 11 as well, local. NBC 26, 9 through NBC. Um, Channel 5, and I also read the Apple Post Press. The local news, also Fox News. Local news, WFRV, WBAY. I watch Channel 11. Right. How many of you get news from Facebook in some way? Just show of hands. Oh, all of you. At least some news from Facebook. Okay, great. So again, so much of what they know is based upon the fact they get their news locally, and it causes their orientation to be disproportionately local. 
Moving on to the next slide. One of the things to keep in mind is that because they are low information voters, the thing that's important to know is that they don't know a lot about the Demo they did not know a lot about the Democratic candidates during the primaries. One of the exercises we took them through is we showed them standalone photos of each of the candidates unidentified, an official photo, and asked them on a scale from zero to ten, how confident are you that you could identify this person? From the first six months of research, from March through August of last year. These are the numbers that we had. So Bernie Sanders was at 8.3, Joe Biden was at 7.6, Liz Warren at 5.7, and everybody else was below 5. You see Pete Buttigieg at 1.6. Throughout the entirety of the time he was in the race, he never scored above a 3. So these folks are generally unaware of him. And in fact, for good measure, we actually asked them about one other person, AOC. She scored higher than all but three of the candidates. And when you'd ask people about someone like Biden, they knew nothing about him other than that he had been Obama's vice president. They had no clue what state he was from, that he had been a senator in the past. They didn't know what Bernie Sanders' current job was. And this is universal. They basically just know just the most surface things about these people. Next. So what are they like? Normally in a longer presentation, I would take you through this in more detail. I'll just give you a quick top lines and some quick bullets. They have a very clear America first mindset on immigration and trade. They're perfectly fine with President Trump saying that immigrants can't come into the country right now. You, across the board, they think they're protecting the country and they're protecting the immigrants from, getting, from us getting them sick. They're also uh, opposed to uh, major trade agreements, and they are very uh, pro-tariff. They have a, a strong receptivity to populist and anti-corporate arguments. So a lot of Elizabeth Warren's messaging, similar to the president's, about the system being rigged and large companies taking advantage of people is very resonant for them. The next thing you should know is that they thought impeachment across the board was a waste of time and money. They were resentful of how much money was spent on it, and they think that the whole thing should be decided at the ballot box this year. There was an aggressive pushback on impeachment. They know almost next to nothing about Joe Biden, as I mentioned. Uh, during the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic, uh, they said they've barely heard from him. They don't know what he said about it. They don't know where he stands. And most of what they do know a little bit about him more broadly is unflattering. You hear things about his mental acuity. You hear things about his son and Burisma. That's from just a handful of people who know anything. Most of them have heard nothing from him and have very little to say about him. And then when it comes to the president, they'll tell us that they don't like his tweeting. But universally, they'll admire his business acumen, his ability to shake things up, and his sort of tell it like it is bravado. That is, that's the reason why so many of them stick with him, and I'll get to that in a second. And then the final point on this slide, which I think is critically important. Before the pandemic, I repeatedly asked about whether they were looking for a calmer time, that sort of returning to a pre-Trump era would be something that they'd be yearning for. And their response, interestingly, was not at all. They thought that America is filled with examples of times when things have been tumultuous. We're in a tumultuous time but plenty of things have been tumultuous going back to the 17 and 1800s, like they talked about Aaron Burr shooting Alexander Hamilton. So there, there are people who uh, really do not think that we're living in a particularly peculiar time, which, again, if you're a mainstream Democrat, will seem bizarre, but if you are one of these swing voters, we're just living in another time that happens to have a lot of stuff going on. Next slide. So we asked people in a hypothetical matchup. This is the first year's worth of responses, the raw numbers of people. If Obama could run against Trump this year, who would you vote for? Among the Obama-Trump voters on the left, 69 out of the total would vote for Trump, and a much smaller 28 of them would vote for Obama. This is aggregated across the first year of research. On the right, you see almost all the Romney-Clinton voters, and there are much fewer of them, would vote for Obama over Trump. Focus on that number 69 on the left. This is the hypothetical between Trump and Obama. Next slide, you'll see Trump against Hillary Clinton in a rematch, and you see what happens to those numbers. It goes all the way up to 88. So you have a very interesting dynamic here. Hillary Clinton, I would sort of argue, uh, is the low water mark against Trump, and Obama seems to be the high water mark. And I think that, that has real implications for this year. So that was pre-pandemic. What about now? Are people sticking with the president still? And if so, why in the midst of a pandemic? Well, I was interviewing voters in Iowa a couple weeks ago. And here in this video, you hear why they are still staying with President Trump. 
At their hearing, you still support the president despite 80,000 people dead, unemployment at 14.7%. Why haven't you bailed on the guy? Well, I think he's trying. I think no matter who would be president right now, they're trying. They're they're trying to do what they think is best. And he did get, you know, that stimulus check out to us, which did help. He's dealing with this the best he can. Okay. You know, if, if you can't look at somebody and their decisions and just automatically say that they're wrong when it doesn't benefit you. You you have to step back and look at the total picture, everything that they were dealing with and trying to balance setting, you know, setting the country down for two weeks versus letting it run its course and see where the hot spots are and shutting those states down. And, and we don't have privilege of all that information. I think just like taking in all the unknowns and like no one's ever had to go through something this significant. So giving it a chance to play out, I guess. Again, I don't think it's, it's uh, Trump is at fault with this. He can close everything down. He can make a strict order for everybody to stay at home. You walk out of your house, you can get arrested, you can do all that. He can do all that you want. There's still going to be people out there that's just going to do it. They're going to get it. They're going to get sick. With the unemployment part, it's not his fault. You know, you can't blame him for it being 14, 15, 20 percent high, the highest it's ever been because of this pandemic. You know, you just can't. Well, because if you think back three months ago, all those numbers are flip-flopped. The economy was as strong as it's been in 50 years. Unemployment was the lowest it's been in 50 years. He he brought us from not a really great financial situation in, in 2016 to where we were at the beginning of 2020. Um, he did it once. Can he do it again? Yeah, he can. So that gives you a real sense of how people are thinking about the pandemic and thinking about the president in this pandemic. So it's a, it's a critically important perspective on, on what's happening. So let's pivot now and talk a bit more about what's happening uh, on the environmental front. So the environment to me is the sleeper issue in this election. And we uncovered something I think that is particularly compelling having to do with regulations. Go on to the next slide. Swing voters are very troubled about the administration's efforts to loosen environmental regulation. And in fact, as Axios covered it, they don't like his rollbacks. As Amy Harder covered uh, some of our focus groups. Let me show you what the data that she was looking at. So we asked people in four sessions, going from November through February in four different locations, the following. On a scale from zero to 10, how much do they support or oppose the rollbacks um, of a variety of regulations related to the environment? And you see, with five being neutral, the average score was 4.4. So before they saw any regulations, they were asked just generally what they thought of the rollbacks based on that question, and they were slightly negative, 4.4 out of 10. And then we showed people a list of the rollbacks. Next. And they saw 17 of them, one at a time, and were asked to score them on how much they support or oppose them, zero to 10. I'm gonna show you the list in descending order. Here's the first page of them, starting at 4.7. So nothing on average scored above five. They all started negative and go down. First one, having to do with tracking tailpipe emissions, uh, re re uh, rewriting Obama rules, having to do with air pollution in national parks, uh, withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord, uh, shrinking the size of national monuments in Utah, changing the way the, the Endangered Species Act is applied. So you're down at 3.1. Next slide. And what you see are the scores dropping even further here, loosening rules about toxic emissions, 3.0, revoking uh, Obama-era rules about ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes waters, um, rules about oil and gas companies installing technology, uh, revoking rules having to do with greenhouse gas emissions. And the numbers keep dropping even further. Next slide. Completed a uh, uh, rule to clear away for drilling in, in Anwar. Um, underwater ground protections for uranium. Um, fracking on Native American land. Uh, minimizing impacts um, on, on water and wildlife and revoking those. And then one more page. Seismic air guns being used uh, for oil exploration in the Atlantic. 
uh, off, loosening offshore dr drilling safety regulations after uh, the Gulf of Mexico disaster, uh, revoking a rule that prevented coal mines from dumping mining debris into local streams, and loosening EPA regs having to do uh, with discharge into waterways. So a couple of things I just want to flag for you. Almost all the ones at the very bottom had to do with water and the purity of water, which to me I thought was quite interesting. Next slide. People are unaware of these efforts. That was the thing that stood out, was that they, they didn't like them, but they also didn't know about them. They had not heard about these rollbacks. It was as though they had never occurred. Next. And what we did was we had them, after seeing the list, rate the broad original question over again. So pre versus post. Uh, next slide. So they were asked this question again, and here's what happened. The 4.4 dropped to a 3.2 on average. That's quite a drop in the course of just seeing a list of 17 rollbacks. Next. Let me show you what happened when I asked about the list in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, back in January. Why did you like those rollbacks? Because they affect our air and our water quality, which is causing illnesses, and we don't have health, great health insurance. What was your reaction to seeing that list of 17 items? Scary. Scary. Disturbing. It's greedy. Well, all the rollbacks for the big companies, they can make more money. It's just the basis of life that they're messing with. For how many of you is this a voting issue in November? It would be a voting issue for me, yeah. I thought that was particularly interesting that this would be a voting issue for a sizable percentage of them. So one thing that we did also was we asked them to, in the last session we did, we didn't do this in the previous three, but in the last one, we asked people in Florida what they thought of President Trump's argument in favor of the rollbacks. So you see listed on the screen, the president has said for many decades, we've had a maze of regulations that uh, cost us trillions of dollars, millions of jobs. Um, we need to use this to, we have to do this to restore jobs and grow the economy. And the score was at 2.6 on their support or opposition to the rollbacks. In other words, after they saw the broad, you've now seen the president's done, how much do you support or oppose? It was at 2.6. Once the president made the argument for why the rollbacks were important, it stayed at 2.6. In other words, when the pres by showing them this quote from the president, it did not cause their positivity to rise. They were still very negative even after they heard the president's argument. Next slide. The local aspect of this is what matters. They found that if one or more of these rollbacks affected the air or water quality where they live, they would be very troubled that, by that. On a scale from 0 to 10, in terms of being very, not at all troubling to very troubling, you're at 8.7 in terms of very troubling very high level of, of concern about the local nature of it. Next slide. Let's talk about climate for a couple of minutes. It's not a top of mind problem, but once the issue is presented, they do express some concerns about it. The point, as Axios covered, Amy wrote about it, it's not a hoax and it's not an emergency. What, what they think about it, it's kind of somewhere for most of them in the middle. Next. So, when we asked people, um, we asked people to name uh, their top issue of concern going into the election. And what we found that people talked about health care, the economy, jobs, immigration, cuts to public programs, but not a single person said as their top issue, climate change, global warming, or environmental issues as their single top choice. I should say, though, that when we asked people whether it was in their top five, a number of them said yes, but it wasn't their top issue. Next. And I just sort of kind of want to wrap up the presentation today by talking about the, a warning of sorts, that the pandemic debate about science very much echoes the debate over climate change. I'm going to play for you two sets of clips. The first is from focus groups I did in April in Ohio and how people talked about scientists. They were asked basically whether scientists were on balance a net positive or a net negative. And here's what they said in April about scientists. Please play the clip. I think it's amazing the vaccinations and cures that they've managed to come up with for different things, you know, and it needs to just keep rolling. You know, the, the fact that they've managed to wipe out major diseases, that's amazing. You know, I'd love to see them do it with Corona. 
Well, I guess in general, I don't hear much about science. Though so there is a crisis or some tremendous breakthrough right now, just hearing this is not just the theoretical science that they're in a college observatory thinking and coming up with wonderful theorems and ideas, but this is very practical science. They're putting it to use. And uh, so that's, that's increased my respect and understanding of the science a little bit more. It's showing more now than, than before or with me. I'm realizing it more now that we do really have to rely on the science to, to come up with where viruses come from and, and how they were made or, or so I, I do respect them more. I think I just never really thought about it that much before. So that's April. So you see that generally they're positive about scientists and it was universal across that group. Everybody saw scientists more positively. In May, when I was talking to those folks in Iowa, there were a few people who, who were more negative about the science. And I just want you to hear why they said they were more negative. Most of them were positive, but a few of them were negative. I just want you to hear the, the commentary. Please play the next clip. Maybe I'm looking at the standpoint that we're getting like so many scientific experts, like so many opinions out there that I feel like it's just hard to know who to trust. That's the standpoint I was looking at it from that. We're just like getting thrown so many different scientific experts and one of they can be like on two different ends on the spec of the spectrum. So for me, that was negative just because I don't know like which scientific expert to believe. You know, computer models are only good as the information you put into it, and don't always think that the uh, the full story gets plugged into a computer model, um, so that the the data that comes out isn't necessarily accurate. So you get a real sense there. Those sound like the exact kind of comments you would hear about people who are questioning the climate science. So. Go back to the presentation. Four key things to keep in mind. One, as low information voters, we have to pay a lot of attention to those who don't pay much attention at all. That's my admonition to you. If you want to know what's going on, focus on these Obama Trump swing voters. Next. Trump is seen as an America first disruptor and Joe Biden, he's still for them a complete non-entity. They really don't know much about him. He really has to introduce himself to the public. Next, most of them remain in President Trump's camp, as you saw, based upon the hypotheticals we posed. And the sleeper issue, as we talked about, is the environment, particularly the regulatory rollbacks that would affect people's air and water locally. And with that, I think I'm going to end on one Quasi humorous note, Michael Smirkanish had me on recently, this is back in March, and he asked me about President Trump. Bottom line, you've now been in Minnesota, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Iowa. What's the one big takeaway that you have found from swing voters in those states? The big takeaway is this. Uh, swing voters feel about President Trump the way the royal family feels about Prince Harry. And that is they love him, they support him, but if he, go, if he goes totally off the rails, they'll leave him there. <laughs> they'll That's leave the him takeaway. in Canada if he, if, if he goes totally off the rails. So um, I've been thinking about that clip because that was uh, right as the pandemic was, uh, was approaching and whether um, it's still the case. And you now have a bit of the answer as to where, uh, where these swing voters stand uh, since I did that interview. Uh, here's where we're going for the remaining sessions, and uh, we're very much looking forward to staying quite busy for the next six months. And with that, I'm um, happy to turn it back to Joe and take your question. Rich, I'm going to let the, the system here catch up uh, as I pop back on screen. Uh, we are getting questions in. I want to uh, remind folks that the little Q&A button on the right-hand side of your screen is how you should uh, ask Rich a question. I'll try to batch them together and uh, Rich give you a couple to, to chew on uh, and we can move through this. Uh, I will say that I've been watching the attendees uh, and um, not a single person dropped through the entire presentation. So you had them from the get go uh, through the end, Rich. Uh, well done. Great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start you. off just with a, with a softball um, or maybe just sort of your, your take on 
the people that you're talking to, how are they weathering the quarantine and the coronavirus? Uh, just just as a you know, just as a subset of our uh, of humans as as our neighbors, how, how are they doing? Uh, they're not doing great. Uh, when I ask them what emotion they've been feeling the most in the past week, I get answers like scared, anxious, uncertain. Uh, there's a lot of fear out there. And I think people need to really understand th these aren't people who are kind of just like skating by in their big backyards, you know, and you know, they're, they're, they're just feeling good about things. You know, they're economically stressed. They've been anxious about catching it themselves, particularly if they're older. So there's a, a lot of anxiety in the country right now, and I wouldn't minimize it at all. And I'm going to guess that the, when you start asking these political questions, it's probably the first time that they've discussed them or that they've started to think about them in this moment. Uh, you know, we're making these connections that coronavirus and this moment connect up to the election. But my guess is, and I'm testing this with you, that most folks aren't. They're, they're worried about their day to day. And it's, the, it's, it's the, this moment in time that they're focused on. Yeah, they're focused on the moment in time. They are, as, you know, because of the way they're getting their news, very locally focused. So when I ask, for example, about uh, Governor Reynolds in Iowa or, or Governor DeWine in, in Ohio, they had plenty of opinions about how they were handling the issue in their state. And they were generally very laudatory. One of the things that was so interesting about comparing Governor DeWine to President Trump was that the Ohio people, I had never heard of a, an elected official, particularly a governor, have their virtues extolled to the degree I heard them in that conversation about DeWine. I asked them about their satisfaction with his handling of coronavirus on a zero to 10 scale. They were at nine and a half. President Trump was down in the seven. It wasn't that they hated what Trump was doing. They just loved what DeWine was doing so much more and wished that Trump were more like DeWine. But they hadn't bailed on Trump. They basically liked a different approach. Notably, Governor DeWine modeled a uh, mask just, uh, I think, last week or earlier this week uh, to try to push that as, as states reopen. All right, I'm going to ask yeah, a question. Can, can oh, I jump in for one quick second on, on the mask thing? It's really important. Uh, we, apart from the Swing Voter Project, I'm also doing something called the Back to Normal Barometer, which is a national survey looking at what it'll take to get back to normal. And I just want to blow up one uh, argument that you've been hearing a lot about in the news in the last two weeks, which is that Republicans are opposed to masks and Democrats are in favor of masks. There's a slight difference between those two groups, uh, depending upon what question you're asking. But I will tell you this, the big difference is by age, not by party. And it is senior citizens who are way disproportionately in favor of mask wearing and don't like it when people fail to wear a mask in public. And I've seen this across multiple studies, uh, multiple questions that we asked in our study, I uh, asked different ways. I think that people just have to get wrap their head around the idea that mask wearing is not the partisan thing that people think it is. It's great. It's a great news line, but it's not that what's really happening. What's really happening is senior citizens way, way, way concerned about this middle aged and younger way less. I've seen quantitative numbers, both nationwide and key states that would uh, easily support that, too, that there's wide support for wearing masks, that if it, if it did break in party lines, you wouldn't see that. So a great exactly. point, Rich. I'm going, to, I'm going to start a question, then I'm going to ask David David's question, who came in uh, in one of the earlier uh, in one of the earlier Q and A's from our group here. We we know where we know where these folks are getting their information. Are they do they trust it? Do they trust the news media? And and I think those are two different things: what they're listening to and who do they trust, or are they different? That's that's my question, and I'll ask David's question along with it. Where does uh, AM news radio and talk shows fit into this? Is it greater than social media? Do they listen to Fox, meaning that they listen to AM radio? So I'll give, the, give you those two questions to chew on uh, and take it away. Well, the, the level of trust in the media is abysmally low. I'll ask them, how much do you trust the uh, news sources that, uh, that are out there? And the scores are like a one on a zero to 10 scale. The trust level is horribly low because they think that basically a lot of the stuff is either being made up if they disagree with it, and they don't think that uh, they're hearing news, they're hearing lots of opinion. So there's a lot of frustration with the way news is being covered. So, and I think that's also, by the way, one, one reason why there's a disproportionate focus on local news, because it's less political. It's more about traffic and weather and 
you know, which schools are open on a snow day or that kind of stuff. So they can rely on stuff that's local. I also think it's more verifiable and it's a lot more relevant to them. I did not hear a lot about uh, talk radio or AM radio. I know it has a much wider audience than a lot of the cable. I mean, you look at the number of people who watch Sean Hannity or Rachel Maddow on a given evening, it's just three or four million in a country of 300 and what, 20 or 30 million people. So th those audiences are small, but things get caught in an echo chamber. And I think there's a lot of stuff that kind of gets picked up wherever you happen to be getting it. And these people, as you heard from themselves, are getting it all over the place. But the thing I would say is that if you're trying to reach them, if you're a, a candidate for president, either Trump or Biden, that you have to fo focus on local news. And you have to find the sources that they are, they are getting their news from. And you saw, you know, the, all those women in Wisconsin, virtually all of them get their news from local TV. Great points. Great, great points. Uh, and I, I thought when uh, you asked if they're getting their information on Facebook, something that I've picked up in research that we've done is that people are consuming news sometimes at the same time. And by that, I mean, you will have the TV on and it may be the local news, but you may also have someone on their phone or an iPad or another tablet and they're scrolling through Facebook. That, that they're also yeah. consuming this information uh, in a multi-mode way, sometimes together. Making making our job harder, as as you sort of pointed out, educating folks on these on these environmental rollbacks, and I'll sort of move to the environmental piece here, um, is is potentially a a path forward here. But people are really really uh, um, inundated with with how they're getting information. Yes, absolutely. You know, I have a teenage son who consumes two or three sources of media simultaneously, and so I I see this, and I I, mean, I find it dizzying most of the time to think that, but. You know, I'm 55 years old, so it's not, I'm, not, I'm not 16 uh, looking at this in you know, the way someone who's younger is accustomed to, to consuming that media. So, yes. But, you know, a lot of these folks also are not consuming media constantly. I'm thinking about the people who are on this call with us, uh, Joe, and I'm thinking about the fact that media consumption is just something you do all day long, and it's done actively. My sense from a number of my respondents is that it's done much more passively. It's like what pops up on your smartphone. Not that you're necessarily looking for it, kind of that just like what crosses your path almost accidentally in the course of a day. And that's what I want people to wrap their head around, is that some people are active consumers of news. They're dying to know what's happening next. They want to see what's happening at the White House or in Congress or the state capitol. These folks generally are not like that. There are a few who are, but most of them are much more, hey, oh, I, can't, I, I, I saw something about this. I saw something about that. Don't know where it came from. Not terribly aware of it. Let's go to some of the environmental questions that we're, that we're catching here. I think they're great. So I'm gonna start with Wilson's question. How does the environment rank with swing voters this year, especially with health and the economic crisis soaking up so much attention? And maybe I'll, I'll sort of do a spin on that. Uh, you mentioned what you saw uh, previous to uh, COVID. Maybe talk a little bit about um, the shift if you're seeing one post COVID. Yeah. So. Uh... The issue, as I mentioned before, was when people just asked, what's your top issue? You saw that no one said climate, global warming, environmental issues. Um, but when you asked them, is climate change or global warming in your top five, um, a good a size, I forget what percentage exactly, but a, a reasonable percentage of them say, yes, it's a top five issue for them. So it matters. I think what, what's happened since the pandemic is that every other issue has been crowded out by this. So... For example, in Iowa, I asked people, what's your top issue right now? And, and basically all of them were, were related to COVID one way or the other. But when I asked them, what would have been your top issue in January, the three of the eight, for example, said education was their top issue. So the things that matter to people, they still matter, but they've receded to the background. And what matters now is COVID-19. So I'm going to ask this from an, an advocate perspective. And I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Mark's question, which I think is, is spot on here. And he asks, what I'm hearing is that environmental advocates can create greater impact by informing voters about the harm that Trump has done with respect to, tra to traditional pollutants than warnings about climate change. So he's asking here uh, the traditional pollutant argument um, from what you've heard uh, is most, most useful if you are an advocate trying to say, make sure Trump is a one-term president. So I, I have to be careful not to be giving specific political advice one way or the other here. Let me, let me try to do it as neutrally as I possibly can, which is that um, 
what matters most to people is what's happening locally. And if you can point to a local harm that is tied to a specific policy and say, this happened because of that, and you're likely to suffer that harm as, on the receiving end, then I think you've got a compelling argument. The thing about climate is that it's not, for most of these folks, a top-tier issue. It's kind of like, eh, yeah, I'm concerned about it. It's a second-tier issue. It's long-term. I'm not sure it's affecting me right now. Um, so with a lot of that mindset, I think it's important to, to focus on what matters to people. And if you think that the water coming out of your spigot is, is polluted because of a rollback of environmental regulation, then you've got something that people need to focus on. I think that's, that's where the opening is for an advocate. And if you're on the president's side, basically, you know, you wanted to say, well, you know, that, that, that had no impact on it. That's completely implausible. The fact that you have, you know, more uh, uh, pollutants in, in your drinking water, that has nothing to do with anything that, that I did as, as president. So, you know, depending upon obviously which side of it on that, that's how you would argue it. I'm going to ask Bob's question as a follow-up to that. And uh, it, it is, and let me sort of, let me try, try to get this right. Um, if a candidate says that they will avert, they were working to avert catastrophic climate change uh, and intense storms and droughts, that is that useless? Should we only be talking about uh, water and air pollution in some of, in some, I'll, I'll, and I'll add, I'll add to Bob's question, in these swing states with this swing demographic? Yeah. So if you're focused, again, but being careful not to give specific campaign advice here, I would say if, if you're focused on the swing voters in the swing states, the much more compelling environmental arguments are the ones that I was talking about having to do with, with drinking water and air pollution where you live. You can still talk about climate, but I would focus a lot more on a more positive, forward-looking, can-do type of argument as opposed to trying to scare them with a climate argument. And with these folks, what I would do, and this comes from a huge amount of work I've done over the last six years on talking to conservatives about climate change, is that I initially thought when I started doing work on this in 2014 that ramping up the it's an emergency, the world's coming to an end type of argument would get them animated, and actually for many people it's paralyzing because their response is, what do you want me to do about it? And they feel as though they, they're powerless and it really – is, is, is disempowering for them as, as from a voting and, and a civic engagement perspective. The more effective approach is to say, I have a clean energy future that is important to you and your children and grandchildren. It entails policies A, B, and C. Here's why it's good for you. Here's how you will benefit now. Here's how you will benefit in the future. And then once you get through all of that, say, and if you happen to be concerned about climate change, it also helps with that. So I would do, so rather than have it be a problem solution construct, I would have it be a solution back into the problem construct with these voters. Because for them, there's a lot of, you heard competing science that they're hearing about. They're not sure about how serious the problem is. They're not sure if they're experiencing it themselves. So what they can glom onto is something that they go, oh, yeah, more clean energy, that sounds good. Yeah, I want to have more of that. And, in fact, you know in a number of the upper Midwest states that there are specific statewide policies that are meant to promote more clean energy. I would be favoring and supporting those, saying what those could be do done to expand it, and say one reason why it's important to do it is because it will help us with the climate change problem. But, but with these swing voters, and, and even more importantly with, with Trump voters generally, if you're trying to engage them, you don't want to sound like Al Gore. And I don't mean to disparage the former vice president, except to say his rhetoric when it comes to people on the right is completely toxic. And it is not resonant at all. They think, they think that he is presenting them with what I would describe as an alternate religion. And the alternate religion is climate change uh, action, as opposed to what they believe. And I'll just, I know this is a long answer, Joe. I'll just end with a quotation from my favorite climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, who a number of you are familiar with at Texas Tech. And her line is, and you know, she's an, she's an evangelical Christian and one of the country's leading climate scientists. So she sees this from both perspectives, religious and, and scientific. And her line is, these folks have a religion they already like, and they're not looking for a new one. 
And that's the thing that people who are more conservative, not just my swing voters, but people more conservative than that, are very anxious about, is that feeling as though you're taking away their religious beliefs and replacing it with some secular religion where Al Gore is the godhead. And they, they absolutely resent it. So you have to find a way to thread the needle and the way I'm suggesting by focusing on shared values and shared concerns, which is more clean energy, is the way that you get there. Super helpful. I'm going to zoom a little bit towards some of just the more nuts and bolts political questions. Uh, but before I do that, to me, the, the, the thing that, that caught my ear as you, were, as you were talking is the word conservative. Now, I want to set this up as you're talking to Obama, Trump voters, or Romney, Clinton voters. Would you say that they would call themselves conservative? So I would say that um, some of them would and some of them would not. So the, I should make a di distinction between Romney Clinton and Obama Trump voters. So the, the Romney Clinton voters are basically almost to a person universally disgusted by President Trump. The Romney Clinton voters, there's a reason why you voted for Romney in 12 and then you jumped to Hillary Clinton in 16. And the reason was that Donald Trump completely put you off as a Romney Clinton voter. So those are people who tend to be, I think, a bit more conservative generally, but just could not abide the president. The Obama-Trump voters, I think, are they're all the way from center to far right. Um, they may have had issues with Mitt Romney for various reasons, so they couldn't have voted for him. Maybe it was you know, his religious beliefs as a Mormon that they found off-putting. They somehow voted for Barack Obama, and then when they had the chance to vote for President Trump, they voted for him. So some of them are moderate, some of them are conservative. What I think unifies them is the idea that America has not been put first in public policy. And that's one reason why build the wall and renegotiate these trade agreements is so compelling and such an important argument to them. And what the president is able to do and has done, and one reason why he won was he's able to get those blue collar Democrats in the upper Midwest say, ah, He's going to bring my job back. He's going to bring manufacturing back. Those immigrants who took my job or, or, the, or the jobs that got shipped overseas, he's going to bring that back to me. And that was what was compelling. So it's not necessarily a conservative argument. It's an economic populism argument that cut across not only conservative America, but a swath of liberal America and created for, for Trump a new coalition of people who found that to be a very compelling message. So I want to ask Christian's question as a follow-up to that, that these people don't seem to be swing voters anymore. They appear to be strong Trump supporters. Do you think that they're still swing voters? Well, I, I've gotten that question before. Um, it's a great, great, great question. So to me, there, were, there are two categories of Obama-Trump voters. I should have mentioned this a little bit earlier. So there are people who are Obama-Trump voters who, are, who, who voted for Trump because they liked what Trump was saying, like I was talking about America first. Then there's a subsegment of them, the ones who would take Obama back, for example, who voted for Trump because he wasn't Hillary Clinton. And I think that's roughly about you know, a quarter to a third of them. So when you ask them, would you be willing, among the people who voted for Trump and like Trump, would you be willing to consider someone else? Most of them will still say yes. They're not completely locked into the president. They are... Uh, I like to sometimes describe them as serial presidential monogamous, meaning they voted for Bush for eight years. They got sick of dating him. Someone came along named Obama. They liked him. They voted for him. They stuck with him for eight years. They got sick of him. And then someone named Trump came along and they started dating him. And for me, the question is, do they want the relationship to end after this year or do they want four more years of it? And that is, to me, the, the $64,000 question. Is Joe Biden able to peel some of these people back because Trump does not fulfill what they need emotionally? They're also change voters. You know, some people vote for a candidate because they're a liberal. Some people vote for a candidate because they're conservative. And some people just like change. And the question is, is the change that Trump is bringing something that, that most of these voters find appealing? And as you heard in the clips I played, for a number of them, they're still willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. They still think he'll be able to bring things back. And a number of them are optimistic. But there are people at the margins who I'm seeing a little bit here or there that, that Biden might be able to appeal to. But it's going to be a heavy lift for him. It's, it's not as though these Obama-Trump voters are sitting around going, 
oh, wait a second, yeah, Trump, uh, I'm not liking everything that's happening. How can I find a reason to vote for Biden? They're not. Biden has to make that case. And as I pointed out to you, Biden is a blank slate for a number of these people. You, you know, it, it's, political people find it so hard to believe. Oh, my God, how do they not know about Joe Biden? He's been in the public eye since the early 1970s. And the fact of the matter is he is not well known. Let's stick in this, you know, 50 minutes in, I like how things shift a little bit. Now we've now we've got entered into the final stage, which I'm going to call presidential bachelor. Um, and we, we, as these people start dating uh, Joe Biden, and I'll ask a couple questions uh, that folks have about about the vice president and his race. Do you think have, have you get any sense um, from your interviews or research? This is Jason's question. Uh, if there are any VP prospects that you think would be strong or weak with these swing voters? Yeah, so I've asked about some of the prospects. Um, well, first of all, I got a little pushback that, that, that Biden announced that he was going to select a woman. Some of the swing voters said to me, well, why doesn't he just pick the best person? Why did he have to pledge to pick the best woman? That, I thought, was a bit eye-opening. Um, I have heard people uh, mention, I asked them who would be a good person for him to run with, and Kamala Harris has come up, and Elizabeth Warren has come up, Amy Klobuchar. Um, there's not a huge amount of familiarity with any of them, though. And so the thing I would think that is sort of a second task that Biden would have would be not only introducing himself to a lot of people who are not terribly familiar with him, but introducing a vice presidential candidate who would be compelling and be interesting and cause people to go, wow, I want to take that person seriously. But most of the swing voters have told me that they're not voting on the vice presidential pick. They're voting on the presidential nominee. And I think it's the old saying that the vice presidential pick can only do you harm. It can drag you down, but doesn't particularly lift you up. And it's probably true for Biden as well, that it's not going to make that much of a difference in the end, at least to these particular swing voters. They're looking to see what Biden would do as, as president and how he contrasts with the president. The other thing I would say about Biden also is they, they, they need to hear from him what his plans are. A lot of them have no clue what he plans to do if they elected him president. How would their lives be better? Tell them what the things are that he specifically needs to do to improve the quality of their lives. I don't think he has, he has penetrated on that at all. I think from the moment Trump ran, he was very clear. My job is to do four words, make America great again. And to do that, I'm going to build a wall. And Trump, whether you love him or despise him, he is a master marketer. And he knows how to take a complex idea, boil it down to a few words, and have every person with a third grade education or more be able to completely and utterly understand what he is saying. And I think that as Joe Biden thinks about what the campaign is going to sound like um, and how Trump is going to position himself and position himself against Biden, that Biden himself has to look at that and say, I have to stand for something that, sta that, that fits on a bumper sticker. And I don't think these swing voters have heard yet, or if at least they have not articulated back to me, a bumper sticker phrase that they attribute to Joe Biden, other than I'm not Trump. All right, Rich, lightning round. I'm going to try to do these in, in two minutes. Allison says, right, how, how will they know if he's gone off the rails? That's a great question. So, you, so that's why I sort of played that clip at the end, because when I said it, obviously the pandemic hadn't hit yet. Um, and the, the issue is, you know, I think if, he's un, if Trump is unable, if the health situation clears in the fall, but the economic situation is still dire, a number of these swing voters said that they would have issues with Trump because it will show that he failed to get the economy going when the, when the health issue had, had, had cleared. That, to me, would be a sense of going off the rails that he just failed as an economic leader. Another thing would be to do something, I think, so utterly and remarkably drastic internationally, like, you know, nuking Iran, for example, you know, where people are, what the hell is that about? That might do it for some of these folks. But keep in mind, people made a decision. They made a commitment to him. They liked what he was saying, and they're gonna stand, most are going to stand by him, almost irrespective of what he does. It's that classic shooting someone on Fifth Avenue type of question. Jeff's question, when will uh, these voters make their final voting decision? I think they're all over the place. I think, so I've asked some of them this question. I think a number of them are locked in already. And I think a number of them will wait until the very end, and they'll, have to, they'll decide. They'll want to see what happens in the debates. Uh, 
They'll see how the issues play out. They'll see what the state of the economy is. Uh, for them, the question is, you know, are they better off than they were four years ago? And what amazingly, I've been asking that question in the last uh, couple of sessions, and most of them tell me they still think that they are better off. But one thing I'll say also is that so, since so many of them have been more or less locked in their houses the last two months, they have not seen firsthand the full level of the damage that's been done. I think once they start going back to work and seeing personally with their own eyes how many stores are closed, how many more people are unemployed, that, they will, that, that the reality of how serious this is will begin to set in. I think right now being locked in their home, they're just seeing whatever news they happen to see, they talk to friends, um, and the seriousness I don't think is as real for them um, as it has yet to become. Last question that I, so many people ask, I, I think both of us here, what can we do? What is the single most effective thing that we can do in this moment remotely? Is there something that we can do as a common citizen to ensure that these voters understand what's at stake and understand what, 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 what is, what's happening right now? I would say two things. One is don't force them to become like you. Force yourself to understand them better. I think that the, one of the huge problems we have in this country is that people who have different perspectives are dismissed as opposed to understood. And I think, and so my encouragement would be for you, and this will be a little self-promotion here, go to swingvoterproject.com, where we have all the videos of all the sessions up online, and start watching them and start sharing them with friends who you think, who think right now, oh, this is, a, this is going to be a blowout election for Biden. Or conversely, conservatives who think Trump is definitely going to lose this thing. I think people need to understand where these swing voters are. And these swing voters, by talking to them, and I've now spent, I've done 15 or 16 of these, like 30 hours talking to them. It's abundantly clear to me where they are. But when I talk to audiences, particularly left of center audiences, they look at me like, oh, my God, how could this be the case? We're shocked that people think this way. And the fact of the matter is, you folks who are on this, on this call and on this web, webinar, are people who know other people who know other people who are very well connected. And I think having a true understanding about where these people are, and by the way, I, I'm focusing on them for a reason. They're the weather vane. I think it's a, very difficult for any person to win this election without getting a majority of, those, of these swing voters to vote for them. Because if, those voters, if these arguments don't win with the swing voters, I don't think enough base voters on either side are gonna be supportive. And that's why I'm focusing so much on this group. So this group has to be, <clears throat> excuse me, incredibly well understood. So I would encourage all of you to make sure that you're internalizing what I'm telling you because it'll help you with better decision making. And not just make assumptions about these swing voters, but really try to intuit what they're thinking and how they're thinking about the way the country is going right now. That would be my admonition to you, is that we need to know a lot about these people who don't pay a lot of attention because they, they were forgotten. And again, that's one reason why so many people were shocked in 2016. Oh, my God, where do these people come from? Well, if we'd listened to them the way I'm listening to them, none of what happened in 2016 would have come out as, as much of a surprise. That's Rich, my, I'm going to follow that. My final thought. No, that's fantastic. I'm going to follow that with also a plug for EDF Action, www.efaction.org. I have a question here. Uh, are there going to be volunteer opportunities um, through EDF Action? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Um, we will. I, I think this is a, this is a two-step. Uh, understand where folks are that are that that are not like you, that 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 don't think like you. Understand their motivations, and then uh, we have a lot of work to do, uh, really, to help motivate people to either turn out uh, in November or talk to them about issues they care about. Uh, and again, uh, EDF Action will be at the forefront of of driving uh, of driving that activity. Rich, thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. And crew, thank you for hanging in there. Uh, more than 100 strong, still, still on an hour into it. Uh, if we did not get to your question and you have a follow-up question for either Rich or me, please email us at events at edf.org and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Our discussion will be recorded and has been recorded uh, so that presidential bachelor joke is forever locked in uh, and we'll send around a link. You can enjoy it again. Uh, and uh, so you have this to, to refer back to. Uh, Rich, thank you. Thank you again for joining us uh, and the EDF team this afternoon and for the crew to help pull this together. As always, you're amazing. Uh, 
please uh, continue to get out there, be safe. Um, don't get out there, actually don't get out there, be safe, uh, stay healthy, and thank you again for all you do to support EDF and our work. Thanks y'all. Thank you.